my talk is going to be a little different. So my talk is going to be on the surprising efficiency and exponential cost of fuzzing. So how can something be surprisingly efficient and also come at an exponential cost? So the actual purpose of this talk is to introduce to the weirdness of randomness and probability theory. So given a given the name of the uh, of this event, I won't talk much about the theory, but I want to talk about um, intuition. Um, and one of the key messages that I want you to take away from this talk is that we might have strong intuitions about solving a problem, but without a deep understanding of the problem, sometimes our intuitions might lead us astray. So um, what is fuzzing? Fuzzing um, is a testing process. So here we are given a program, and that program takes four characters. Um, one approach to test this program is called white box fuzzing. White box because the fuzzing, the, uh, the analysis, can actually see the internals of that program. Um, the program has four branches, branches, and we could now try to explore every path in that program simply by trying to capture the conditions of each of these branches. Say one branch is one input would be exercising the path where the first character is not a B. Another in, uh, input would uh, exercise that path where the first input is a B, but the second input is not an A and so on. So we could explore all paths. And at the end, after exploring the fifth path number five, we would see that the program actually crashes. And so in this sense, this approach called white box fuzzing is actually most effective. Why most effective? Because it can actually prove the absence of, uh, of an error, in this case, uh, of an assertion violation, simply by enumerating all paths of the program. Of course, you're making some assumptions, but in principle, we could say that white box fuzzing would prove would be able to prove the, uh, the absence of error in, the, in this sense be most effective. And also it's quite efficient. So uh, if we suppose we, are, we have these five, uh, five paths in that program, if we sample a, a path at random without replacement, we would expect to take about three inputs to find that crashing bug, right? generate by enumerating all of these paths using this technique called white box fuzzing. Um, now, on the other side of the spectrum, there's something called black box fuzzing. Black box fuzzing doesn't know anything about the program. What it would do is simply generate random inputs for the program. So in, um, on most machines, um, a character can take one of 256 values. Uh, and suppose we just randomly generate um, these values uh, using sampling uh, uniform at random with replacement. Um, of course, it can never prove the absence of uh, errors. And in fact, there's this um, great uh, note by Jakestra saying, program testing can be used to show the presence of bugs, but never to show their absence. And so most, more recently, we've looked into this problem um, of giving uh, testing some kind of statistical guarantees. Um, so we can somehow compute what is called a residual risk after a certain amount of testing. But the fact remains, um, black box fuzzing is not most effective. It cannot prove the absence of errors. Right. So then if we look at this from a statistical perspective, I, I said earlier that white box fuzzing, we re require about three inputs and expectation to find that back. Now black box fuzzing, if we sample each input, each value for each character uniformly at random, we would expect to generate about 4 billion inputs before discovering this bug. Sounds a lot. So then white box fuzzing should be better, right? It's the most effective, it's also quite efficient. And here it's where it's going wrong for the first time. At least not always. Sometimes, sometimes black box fuzzing wins. And, the, and this was discovered 40, 30, 40 years ago uh, when people started doing experiments with these uh, two techniques. Um, with the hypothetically most effective technique and with just a simple random sam sampling. Somehow they found that given some limited time, uh, this very simple, very dumb uh, technique wins and finds more bugs than the most effective technique. Um, and so we looked at this very recently um, from a statistical perspective and found that um, a white box, if a white box fuzzer takes too long per input, our black box fuzzer outperforms the white box fuzzer, right? If the generation for one input takes too long, then the black box fuzzer outperforms. Because the black box fuzzer generates 
inputs very fast. So on my machine, it takes about 6.3 seconds to generate 4 billion inputs. And if I had 100 machines, it would take 30, 30, uh, 63 milliseconds. So we can easily scale bug finding because, bug, because black box fuzzing is essentially embarrassingly parallel, right? And so in this paper, we actually give a probabilistic bound on this maximum time. So then uh, is black box fuzzing the best that we can do? Um, and the answer here is wrong. Not, we, can do, we can do even better than that. So what I presented here was a generational black box, black box fuzzer. What it means is I generate um, values for each of these characters. But I could also, instead of trying to generate inputs from scratch, which is gener the general uh, generational approach, maybe we can reuse existing inputs. And this is called mutational black box fuzzing. So suppose we have a seed input, which is bad question mark. Remember, the, the bad input is bad exclamation mark. So if we had a mutational fuzzer, which simply selects the four, which simply selects a character at random, and then chooses a value for that at random, then with a probability of uh, one over four times one over 456, an expectation about 1,000 uh, 1, inputs, which is much less than 4 billion inputs, right? But I cheated a little bit here. We chose a really good uh, seed to start with, right? So can we do even better? Can we somehow automatically discover this seed input? And this is where the third approach, gearbox fuzzing comes in. Can we make, can we take the advantage of black box fuzzing and the advantage of white box fuzzing and kind of combine it? And gearbox fuzzing because we don't actually analyze the program, but we take some feedback called coverage feedback from uh, gearbox fuzzing and we add generated inputs to the corpus which increase coverage. So suppose we just start with a random input. The probability that we generate the first coverage increasing input is one over um, 1,000, um, which means in expectation we require about 1,024 inputs to generate the first coverage increasing input. Uh, we add it to the corpus, then we select this, um, this, uh, this next seed uniformly at random. And uh, in this case, this seed, uh, the probability that we chose this seed uh, this character and generate A as the value uh, requires about 2,000 inputs. So we go on like that and easily, starting from a random input, we, um, we can generate, we can find a bug using only 10,000 inputs. And on my machine, this takes 150 microseconds. So, we, so this is much faster than a symbolic execution tool, which requires all this machinery, constraint solving and encoding and so on uh, for three inputs. Okay. Um, and in the work that we uh, presented at CCS 16, we also boosted Graybox fuzzing simply by choosing that seed, which, is, which exercises the lowest probability domain. And we go down further to 4,000 inputs and to 55 microseconds. Okay, so the insight is, uh, if you have really efficient fuzzer, let's just throw more machines at the problem. You remember on my machine, it takes 6.3 uh, seconds. On 100 machines, it takes 63 uh, milliseconds to find the same bug. Um, so then you might think, uh, well, if I have, I can take x times more machines means I can find x times more bugs, right? And again, we are wrong. So this is an empirical loss. We looked at a lot of data. Um, uh, we where we see this is an exponentially increasing number of machines, a log scale here. And this is the number of additional vulnerabilities discovered within the same time. And we see that an, a linear increase in the number of new vulnerabilities discovered requires an exponential increase in the number of machines. And this is the exponential cost. And a little bit of an explanation here, this is just intuition. Um, if you think about just one buck um, and we increase the number of machines exponentially, for a long time, we won't, for a long time means the number of machines, uh, we won't see uh, that, that buck. And there's an almost linear increase at a certain number of machines. And then we are again almost, um, we have discovered this bug. And so we, we kind of go on with a straight line. If we now, instead of having just one vulnerability, we have 10 vulnerabilities, we kind of get these squiggly lines and they almost look like straight lines. And we increase the number of, the number of vulnerabilities, number of bugs or whatever you want to uh, measure, you find it. Um, we get more and more linear. And the reason for this is that 
we have these kind of constant, we never see that either, either we never see that uh, vulnerability discovered or we always see that vulnerability discovered. And, and in between we have these kind of almost linear increases. This is how we kind of get this um, linear increase for an exponential number of machines. Okay, so intuitively each new vulnerability requires some more resources than the previous vulnerability. So and the constant rate of vulnerability discovery requires exponential amount of resources. So what I showed you is white box, we have a, a technique which we really love to work with, which is really smart, which analyzes the program, which in fact is the most effective. But in practice, it is easily outperformed by a very dumb technique called black box fuzzing, by simply randomly generating inputs. And in fact, this is so, so efficient that we can easily scale that across a lot of machines and find the same, the same number of bugs uh, X times faster. Um, I also talked about it, a machine that kind of leverages the efficiency of black box fuzzing, but it's more like, but enumerates path like white box fuzzing. But then I uh, explained how even that gray box fuzzing technique, include black box fuzzing and gray box fuzzing, are somehow uh, affected by an exponential cost. Thank you so much. Questions? All right. Thank you very much, Marcel. Um, it's it's great to see this kind of quantitative approach to this problem. Um, question coming in from one of the viewers is. How much of the statistics do I need to understand to be able to apply these sorts of techniques? Oh, so there's, there's to apply, there's no need to understand statistics. It's more like in, um, so to understand the statistics is more uh, um, a help for you that, for instance, the insight that you cannot just throw more machines at the problem and then hopefully you find more bugs doesn't work. At some point, you kind of run out of machines because um, because the cost for finding more vulnerabilities is, is exponential. Um, to That's interesting to understand why this is the case. And we use statistics and probability theory to explain why this is the case. But when you apply fuzzing, you don't need to know. You don't need to know, understand the statistics. Maybe one other thing that we explored uh, is that um, um, in we are often interested in the probability that we find a bug if we have not found a bug. Suppose you have run a campaign for uh, 24 hours and then you have not find, find any bug, you still want to know what is the probability that we find a bug with just one more input generated. Um, and this is where you can uh, use statistics 